Did you know that the Starbucks logo is based on a tale from medieval European folklore? Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today's video is all about the tale of Melusine, popular in the modern day as the face of the Starbucks logo. We are going to dive into the story of the serpent Melusine and what it teaches us about the relationship between men and women in medieval Europe. Don't forget, the easiest way to support us is by giving this video a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel and hitting that bell icon for notifications so you don't miss out on any new uploads. World History Encyclopedia is a non-profit organization and you can find us on Patreon, a brilliant site where you can support our work and receive exclusive benefits in return. Your support helps us create videos twice a week, so make sure to check it out via the pop-up in the top corner of the screen or via the Patreon link down below. Melusine is a legendary figure from European folklore and was depicted as a mermaid who sometimes had two tails, as a woman who was serpent from the waist down, or as a dragon. She is associated with a few different French ruling houses, including Anjou, Louisignon, and Plantagenet. And it was believed that she would appear and warn nobles of these houses when death or change was coming. Her story is best known from the 14th century French writer Jean d'Arras, who, at the request of the Duke of Berry, Jean Duc de Berry, wrote his Roman de Melusine. The story of Melusine shares similar features with the Swan Maiden and Valkyrie from Germanic and Norse mythology. In these two types of tales, there is always a supernatural woman who marries a mortal man after the man hides the woman's skin or clothes. In the Swan Maiden, the man hides the magical swan skin, and with the Valkyrie, it is her clothes that are hidden by the man while the woman bathes. Then, the woman is enticed to marry him. They get married, but the husband always betrays his wife by destroying the skin or clothes, causing her to leave her husband. Or, their children find the skin or clothes, and by returning one or the other to their mother, she is able to fly away. Usually, this then results in the husband embarking on a quest to try and prove himself to his wife and bring her home. The main difference between the Germanic and Norse tales and Melusines is that the main male characters in Melusines tales never try to get their wives back because they understand that there's nothing to be done. Melusine's tale is a combination of these stories, as well as the lying in taboo. During the Middle Ages, women after giving birth were believed to be unclean and were physically unable to resume their normal work for 10 to 20 days. During this time, the husband was meant to leave the wife alone and have her only attended by female servants and members of the family. If the husband failed to respect her privacy during this time, some type of bad luck would follow, hence the name The Lying in Taboo. So this makes Melusine's story both an entertaining tale and an illustration of a cultural belief of the time. The tale begins with Melusine's father Elinus, who was a nobleman from either Scotland or England. His wife has just died, so to distract himself from his grief, he goes hunting in the forest. He comes across the Well of Thirst, where he hears a mysterious woman named Pressine singing. Pressine and Elinus return to his cabin, and they talk all night. Elinus falls in love and asks her to marry him, and she agrees, especially after learning of how devoted he was to his first wife. Surely he will be just the same to his second. She would only marry him on one condition though. She makes him swear an oath that he will never try and see her during the birth of any of their future children. Elinus agrees and they get married. Later, Pressine becomes pregnant and gives birth to triplets, three girls, Melusine, Melior and Palatine. And of course, when Elinus hears, he is overjoyed and rushes to his wife's bedchamber, forgetting all about the oath he swore. Pressine calls him a traitor who went back on his word and takes his three girls away to the Isle of Avalon, leaving Elinus all alone to mourn the loss of his wife and children. Pressine is also mourning the loss of her love, and every morning she brings her children to a high mountain and shows them the realm that would have been their home if their father could have only kept his word. 
When her girls turn 15, Pressine tells them the whole story, and unlike Melior and Palatine, who think that it's unfortunate but understandable that their father forgot his promise in such a moment of happiness, Melusine remains silent and begins to plot her revenge on the man who not only hurt her mother, but was the reason they were exiled to Avalon. Melusine convinces her sisters to help her, using their magical powers to seal Elinus inside a mountain with all his treasure. The girls thought that their mother would praise them for taking action against their father, but Pressine was enraged that they would destroy the only happiness she had ever had, which was Elinus's love for her. She punished her daughters severely, with Melior being sealed inside a castle for her entire life. Palatine is imprisoned in the same mountain as her father, and Melusine, who instigated the whole thing, was banished from Avalon and was cursed to have her lower body transformed into a serpent every Saturday. If a man was ever willing to marry her, so long as he never saw her on Saturdays, which he had to swear to, Melusine could live an ordinary life. But if her husband violated his oath and her privacy, she would stay as a serpent and would appear to the noble house in her serpentine form and spend three days of painful lamentation any time a descendant died or the fortress changed hands. Melusine chooses to settle in the woods by a stream near Poitiers in France, where she meets the distraught nobleman Raymondin, who has just accidentally killed his uncle. Melusine consoles him and he falls in love with her, and when he asks her to marry him, she agrees and tells him of all the extraordinary things she will do for him, only if he swears to leave her alone every Saturday. He agrees and they are happily married for 10 years, during which Melusine gives Raymondin 10 children, wealth, land and power. Depending on the version of the tale you're reading, often most or all of the children are deformed in some way, but they are all loved by their parents. Although all is well with the couple, Raymondin's family start to question why Melusine always has to have Saturdays by herself and never attends mass. And that makes Raymondin start to question his wife's loyalty. So one Saturday, Raymondin spies on Melusine while she is bathing and learns of her secret serpent self. He denounces her publicly as a false serpent and his betrayal means Melusine can no longer live a normal life. She either flies out of the window as a dragon or leaps into a river and swims away, depending on the version you're reading, and only ever returns to visit her children or, as her mother's curse stipulated, when someone in the noble family dies or the fortress and lands are passed to someone new. Some versions of the tale end with Melusine finding herself among other creatures like herself and she starts a new life with them and others have her begging her mother for a new body, and so Pressine gives her a male body, which conflicts with her feminine soul, and she is left like this for the rest of her life. It's interesting that numerous noble families would claim descent from Melusine, or choose to link themselves with her in their coat of arms, with her being a supernatural entity that never attended mass. The 14th century French writer Coudre linked Melusine to the Arthurian legends with the figure of the good knight of England, who was a member of King Arthur's court. The Arthurian legend was really embraced by much of Europe's nobility, and although a supernatural entity, Melusine ended up being associated with Christian values and virtues. She has come to be regarded as the great ancestor of European nobility, and her popularity has continued for hundreds of years. Her visage is still a regular occurrence in everyday life as the logo of the popular Starbucks franchise. Why do you think a huge coffee brand would choose Melusine as its logo? Let us know what you think in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on our new videos every Tuesday and Friday. This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. If you like my sweater, you can find this design and a bunch more in our shop at worldhistory.store, or you can find a link for it down below. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you soon with another video.